This is the ExtraTime.com Friday podcast. I'm Oshin Langan. Coming up, we've got Fergal Logan, the Tyrone joint manager, on a wonderful week for them, while our regular Gaelic football analyst, Conley Gilligan, picks his best 15 of the season. His geographical bias is not as bad as you might think it would be. In fact, he doesn't have a geographical bias, so it makes for an interesting 15. We'll also hear from former Bohemians, Finn Harps and Bray player Dave Scully on the FAI Cup quarterfinals tonight, but also Dundalk and how they might handle being in a relegation battle. And they are in a relegation battle. It's somewhere they probably didn't expect to be, either you know, from a playing point of view or a fan point of view. I don't think anyone could have seen this coming for Dundalk this season, even though we're all aware that it's an oddly run club. I mean, I think that's the best way of putting it. But with the talent that they have, I honestly just, I didn't foresee this and I I can't be the only one. Anyway, we'll have more on that a little bit later. Uh, As you may be aware, it's a huge weekend for the Irish rugby team. They take on Italy on Sunday in a must-win match. They had to win the remaining two games of this World Cup qualification pool to have any chance of topping the group and going through automatically. But they had a disastrous result against Spain earlier in the week. Disastrous in a sporting context. And it was a real shock result, but their performance was really poor. Um, Amy Lee Murphy-Crow has been speaking to Virgin Media Sport about what went wrong in that game and how they can get it right for the game against Italy this Sunday. We know we didn't perform. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't us. It wasn't Ireland. It's not what we built on the past few weeks and months. We had a high penalty count. We had a high turnover count. Those two things are very easily fixed. Um, our set piece, we'll be able to sort that out for the weekend and we'll just keep building towards that game. It was a blip in our performance. We're not going to let that happen again. Yeah, I was very disappointed to see it. It's not what you want to see. Um, we're trying to grow the women's game in Ireland, but the RFU, they've put out their apology and the and Leinster. Um, and I just hope that we never see something like that ever again. Amy Lee Murphy-Crow of the Irish rugby team talking to Virgin Media Sport about their poor result against Spain and how they can get it right against Italy. She also was talking in there about the situation that Connacht found themselves in last weekend. Look, I'm sure you've all seen it at this stage. They were given like really ridiculously bad changing facilities and like there was bins there, there was rats there. They've been apologised to by Leinster and the IRFU, which is great. But look, it should never have happened in the first place. It's not acceptable. It can never happen again. Neve Briggs, the former Irish women's captain brought up a, a really good point actually speaking about this earlier in the week on off the ball she asked the question well why weren't the interprovincial teams considered elite why weren't they in dressing rooms and it's a really really good question anyway we'll have more on what we hope is a win against Italy on Monday's podcast right now though before we get to Dave Scully who'll talk to us about the FAI Cup quarter finals and Connolly Gilligan who'll pick his best 15 of the Gaelic football inter-county season let's hear from Tyrone joint manager Fergal Logan on what ha- you know what must have been a wonderful uh, few days since they beat Mayo in the All Ireland football final uh, last uh, Saturday. Fergal, um, congratulations to you first of all, but secondly, can you talk to us about what the last few days have been like? Well, the, the first forty eight hours was fairly chaotic. It's it's uh, calmed down marginally or a bit since, and then the return to the workplace is always a. a, a, a a moment uh, that brings a bit of reality. But listen, it's just been great. There's been an outpouring of emotion in Tyrone. Uh, you know, I think coming off the back of a year and a half and all the lockdowns and then uh, Tyrone just uh, winning in All-Ireland and getting these players getting across the line, as they say, to win uh, medals. You know, I just think uh, it's just been a, a, it's been a great couple of days and a very good weekend, actually. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're just glad to have experienced it. This is a question that you can easily answer whatever way you want retrospectively, but but honesty is great. Um, when you and Brian took over, did you say, right, our aim this year is to win the All-Ireland and if we don't, that's a bad year? Or was it to say, you know what, let's get the best out of this team and let's see where it goes. If that takes us to an All-Ireland, great. Yeah, Oshin, you know, I can tell you, uh, you can interview Brian independently maybe, but I don't ever remember a conversation where I said, we are going to win the All-Ireland this year. I don't even remember one where we said we're going to win an Ulster title. My ambition, as I said before, was to win one match and to represent those that have gone before in Tyrone GA well. Uh, and I suppose genuinely, uh, things were so busy. 
uh, we were in the middle of a lockdown. You were zooming away every night. Things were so busy, and it, it, maybe it's all been a bit surreal. Maybe in an ordinary year and without the backdrop of a public health emergency, you might meet each other and sit down and write out your goals and all that sort of stuff. But I think I would be telling you lies if I said we were as organised as that or as as uh, as our vision was as long as that. It became a vision of trying to gather up players, speak to players over Zoom, chart out a bit of training, and uh, you know we move forward. And, and the reality is this, Sushin, and so it's been no different. Uh, you know, we just went training session to training session, match to match, and it was a busy, busy couple of months. Yeah. And the, the joint managerial ticket thing is something that people sometimes say, oh, I'm not sure that can work. There has to be a manager and there has to be one boss. But obviously, you have made it work. How does it work? What's the balance? Just try and give us an insight if you can. Well, I think in the first night we were appointed up in Garvahi, Ocean, I think I said, listen, it's a collective from top to bottom. As players, you rise or fall together. As managers, you rise or fall together or a backroom team. It's overstated. You're simply as good as your players. And, and everybody in the backroom team is of equal worth and equal value. So myself and Brian genuinely did, never saw that as any sort of handicap or compromise to the ambitions of the team. And if we had, a, you know, that would have concerned us if the team even, for example, were saying, listen, you know, what's going on? I was lucky to play under Art McCrory and Eugene McKenna. And in 95, it wasn't the joint management that didn't get us across the line on the day. And, uh, you know, never, never troubled me. And I'd say it's the same for Brian. At under-21 level, there was Peter, myself and Brian essentially working together. But it's such a big unit now, Oshin County Football and all the people that are needed. The one thing, you know, the, the one thing I'll say is that Peter Donnelly, Collie Holmes, Joe McMahon, those guys, the coaching was su- superb. And that's where I attribute it all to. Des McGuinness on the goalkeepers were plenty happening, the performance analysis. So it's too, the beauty is that I knew in January when we gathered up everybody that we had a serious people, serious operation pushing it down the tracks. I wasn't sure how far it would go down the tracks, but I did say openly that if we got momentum going, it would take something good to stand in our way because I knew there were genuine people in the backroom team who'd all played a high level of football, essentially, not all of them, but a lot of them, and they knew the club scene. And they were genuine Tyrone GA people who really wanted success for Tyrone. And, and that, for me, is the biggest key. You mentioned momentum and its importance there. Did the six goals conceded against Kerry take away some momentum? Or retrospectively, was it kind of a good thing? Was it just one of those times where maybe you and the lads control all deleted? And didn't, like, I'm not saying you ripped everything up and started again. I'm just saying maybe sometimes a day like that can actually turn out to be a good thing. Yeah, well, the momentum of the the cutthroat championship seemed to work well. I know we interrupted the momentum mm. with all the delays and stuff, but only today, as I was driving along, did I remember when I was thinking back. Our championship started the tenth of July in Oma against Cavan, so really it ran for two months. Now those two months, if I'm perfectly honest, felt like eight months. But then people had said, "Well, seventy-seven days from Kerry beat you on the twelfth of June." So that was a serious momentum stopper. But what came to me today in the car as I was driving was that couple of weeks where we were out of the spotlight. That was really the first couple of weeks where we had no games. And that couple of weeks before the Cavan opening championship game on the 10th of July, we were late out of the traps in the Ulster Championship. It might have been the last out. And that meant we played the next Sunday against Donegal the 18th of July. So it came back to me how important that couple of weeks were because we had been stripped bare. We had a fairly open and frank discussion and Brian was at his brilliant best on the video work the Tuesday night after that. And then whatever way Kerry pushed us back the tracks, we sprung back, our momentum sprung back and those couple of weeks were critical and we were lucky we were out of the trap so late in Ulster and they, uh, Again, Holmesy, Joe and Pete and Des and Guinness and these guys and the performance, Dara Burns, my own club, Georgetown Harps. These guys put in serious work in that three or four weeks. And, and I remember at the time thinking, well, listen, we're on here. Plus the players were able to train hard because we had just joined up before the National League and uh, we were straight into the National League. We were the new kids in town, Brian and myself. 
And, uh, you know, we hadn't knuckled into heavy training in any heavy, and with that still to come, that probably is still to come. And, uh, and uh, somewhere with the, this team, but it's just because of everything. So that couple of weeks got the momentum on the road again. And then we, we grew bit by bit. Cavan wasn't nothing brilliant about it, but it was effective. Donegal was a good lift and we, we had a few scares in that game. And then the thing really began to take momentum from there. Yeah. And just after winning Ulster, then everything stops for a while. How difficult was it to, when you were eventually able to train together again and get back together again, how difficult was that? And did you, until throwing, not know where exactly you were or what level you could reach? Absolutely, Ashin. And, and, you know, again, it's only when you're driving along and you get time to think about these things. I remember today some of the conversations we had with players, some that I had from my own house, some that Brian had to have. It, it was far from pretty. It was far from pretty. And their reaction to being sent home from training, being tested, you know, I, 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 we can go into it all again, but that was a particularly difficult period. And I said it uh, before that in all my time in, in football or around football teams, that was the most challenging three weeks, the week before the Ulster final and a couple of weeks after. It. And, and the more time I get to think back and go over the conversations and go over the things, it was just, it was just horrendous. Yeah, I would imagine it was difficult to deal with because players... They just want to play and, and look, when, when it stopped, it stopped. Um, let's talk about the All-Ireland final, the approach that yourself and Brian had. Obviously, Brian had won three as a player, two as a captain. You had played in an All-Ireland final. Unfortunately, it, it, it didn't work out for you on that particular day. Joe Kernan spoke when Armagh won the All-Ireland about how he used the fact that he had lost one as an All-Ireland to prepare. And obviously, it was a big part of his speech. How did it work between yourself and Brian? Was it good to have that balance of someone who had kind of been there and won one, someone who had been there and lost one? How did that work? Did it, or, or was what was that any? What did that have any any bearing on it? Well, you'd imagine you're a bit more relaxed when you have three Celtic crosses in your back pocket. So, on the face of it, at least Brian was possibly a bit more relaxed. I did use my experience as a player and, you know, again, you're balancing it, whether you're overstating your position, whether you're talking about ancient history to guys, the majority of whom weren't even born at that stage. So, you know, you don't want to be, and then you don't overburden them with the, with any tags. So it was, it's it been a, you know, it's been a worrisome couple of months because every phone call, every text, everything you, you're dealing with as a manager. So it was getting the right balance, but listen, you know, being alongside Brian, it means you're alongside a winner and he was probably quietly confident. I would be a bit more, maybe I'm a bit more anxious anyway, but uh, when you've been there once and it went against you, I wasn't, didn't fancy a second one. Did this, and this is, if this is a silly question, by all means say it, that's okay. This is a, this is an honest forum. Does winning it as a manager make up for losing it as a player or are they two different things? What I would say is it certainly eases the position somewhat. You know, yeah. as a player, it must be out of this world. As a manager, it's close to it. But uh, ultimately, I think there's no substitute as well recorded over the years. There's no substitute for playing. But listen, there is a quiet contentment and satisfaction as a manager uh, and a joint manager. And, and just, you know, I'm just relieved, that, you know, that everything worked out. Yeah. And and how difficult was it to pick the team on the way in because, or on the run in? Because... You you Cahill, um, and you had um, uh, Dara. Who, if they were fit from the start of the season, this very weird season, they might well have been starting. But then you know they got fitter. I'm sure as the season went on, and maybe you and Brian were even more tempted to start them. But you didn't for the All Ireland final. How difficult was that decision, or was it a case of well, you know what, it's worked with them coming off the bench. Let's stick with that. Yeah, that was a big debate. Cahill in particular was the big debate uh, because he had been through so much. He contributes so much when he's on the field. Uh, and it was it was a big debate. But ultimately, you know, it, it resolved itself reasonably. And, and probably, again, you're back to sticking with more winning formulas and the impact Cahill gives you, finishing with stronger teams almost than you start with. So when we factored it all into the mix, you know, we didn't, we weren't at the point of 
taking votes or anything like that, even among everybody in the managerial group, so to speak. So uh, it's it was it was difficult, but it was it worked out okay. Yeah, and like I, I can only imagine what it's been like in the last couple of days, seeing the joy that you've brought to people. I mean, it's one thing achieving something yourself and being able to enjoy that, but to see what you've given the county, that must be pretty amazing. Yeah, listen, again, I'm a good while around football and the sort of outpouring of emotion seems to have been as big as I remember. Now, factor in a year and a half of lockdown, factor in a proper Ulster Championship, with no tomorrow every day and factor in the whole all Ireland series as a cutthroat championship. So I think that brings excitement of its own. That might be the end of it. If, if, if word is to be believed. So uh, it just was one of those ones. And, and then I suppose when we were effectively gone from the competition and then back in and then the bookies had us at six to one against in the Kerry game. And when you factor all that in together, we've just come up with a happy mix and uh, the outpouring of emotion has been significant. Obviously, you've been all around Tyrone in the last couple of days, so you may not have seen it, you may not realise it, but the entire country, except maybe for Mayo, are glad for you. And there's a lot of love coming to this Tyrone team. Now, I think a lot of that is because you're always open and have been even before yourself and Brian came in, the players or whatever, they, 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 they were they were always kind of open. And even since we've heard a lot, a lot from the likes of Niall Morgan, who's spoken openly about how his confidence would have been rattled, but he stayed at it. Uh, Connor Myler would have told Thomas Niblock on the BBC GA Social that, you know what, he would have done a bit of work on himself. Ronan McNamee's story, obviously there's an awful lot to admire there. So, like, are you aware of that there, there's their massive admiration? It's, it was never 31 against one it's actually nothing like that. People actually love this Tyrone team. They love this bunch of players. Yeah, no, Ashin. listen, we're glad of that. We appreciate that. Uh, you know, we got on with it, we think, in a manly fashion. And uh, no, we do, you know, much as it's, it's joked about at times about the relationship between Tyrone and everybody else. Listen, we admire m- most or all of the counties. And, you, you know, you have to admire the players, ours included, who go out and put their body and soul on the line every day and these guys did it and I think that it of itself will bring admiration and uh, a warm feeling and then again as you say you know we're just doing our bit and chatting away and nobody's got anything to hide of any note so uh, we have a happy mix and uh, we have some older players we have a good bunch of younger exciting players and listen you know it, it is good to know and understand that you know the rest of Ireland sees a personal face of Tyrone and that uh, we're not just uh, sometimes as described. And, uh, you know, yeah. and the other point is this, Ashin, to be fair to our players, you know, maybe there's been a slight underestimation of how good of footballers there are in that Tyrone team. And I can assure you, they're quality on wheels and they're, they're, they're stellar operators. They're committed to the cause and they're talented. How much of a driver... Was that how big a part did that play in this success? Guys wanting to show how good they were and maybe prove some doubters wrong. Yeah, well, you need you need a bit of edge, and and you know, but I can't say that we we overly stated the fact that we're hated and we this that and the other. I think I think the big driver was that players like Petey Hart, who's a complete another star, would win an All Ireland. Ronan McNamee, Matty Donnelly. The shift they've put into their own football. So for me, a, a great satisfaction comes from that. Niall is a keeper and might have more in the legs, uh, but we'll see. But, uh, you know, there is a great satisfaction in knowing that they're not another set of throne players like happened to the lads in 95 that I soldiered with who were tipped off the edge, hadn't won an All Ireland and felt like losers the rest of their days. This is a victory for for everyone, though, in Tyrone football. I know there's been three wins between 95 and this, but I think, is it fair to say everyone can take something from this? It was it was not just about this bunch of players, it was for all previous generations. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, that's one of my themes, Oshin, without sort of certain patronising back the years. But listen, I, I think it's a victory for everyone. I know Art McCrory is a man that I chat to regularly and would have kept us in some good advice even over the summer. You know, when I think back 
Art and all that he has done in Tyrone football. He's just been a colossus of Tyrone football. And when Art sitting delighted and uh, you know, you know, I take and uh, the players take great pleasure in that because it hasn't been six months or whatever journey we've had. It's been a long journey of building, building, building. We have facilities in Tyrone that if anybody has better facilities in Ireland, I'll shake their hand. That's the endeavour of years and years and years of hard labour, hard money gathering. And, you know, we have big club scene. We have quality players. We have great facilities. So, you know, we should be doing well. And, uh, you know, that's a combination of generations committing themselves to their own cause. Hurling, we're trying to push on with the hurling up here and get it up near the near the top table. And uh, all of that Austrian comes together and it, it is a victory for everybody in my eyes. But I don't want anybody in the older generations or even around mine to think, ah, well, dead on, Fergal, you've now, you've now done something. So, you know, don't be reminding us about our little day out. And of course, we don't know exactly how the championship will play out next year, as in structure wise. So this was the last old school championship. Does that make it even more special? Yeah, if it is, then it is more certainly more special because it's back to the throwback to the olden days when you there's no tomorrow. You know, it's a it's a it's a it's an interesting feeling when you win that game and you know that there's no tomorrow. And we came damn close to hitting penalties this year, which you you wouldn't have put yourself up for. So uh, you know that's one way one way of doing it, and and there is a good buzz out of that when you win. And the other thing is half the, every day you go out, half the field have fallen. And they don't come around the back door literally to 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 bite you. So it goes 32, 16, 8, 4, whatever the miles are very quickly. And we were so close when there was only two of us left in the field. My anxiety was that we would have to start again with 32 in the field. So that was why I was extra keen to try and get the job done. And just before I let you go, do you allow yourself to enjoy this for another while longer? Or are you already thinking, right, how do we evolve this next year? What do we do next year? You know, do we change pieces around? Okay, Kaha will be fit enough to start next year. That change. Are you already thinking about that or are you allowing yourself some some rest for a while? You know, allowing yourself some time to celebrate? Yeah, listen, in truth, Ashin, it's a mix of both. You go through a phase of sort of thinking about all the crack and the entertainment and all and then another... 10 minutes later, your mind might drift into well, how we're we going to start again, when do we start again, who do we start again, what. So it's a good mixture of both, but it is there is a sense of quiet contentment that uh, we've managed to win in all Ireland and, and we didn't foresee it. We couldn't guarantee it. We didn't foresee it necessarily. And certainly this summer, at times, it was a million miles away from us. Well, look, Virgil, I think um, all we can say is congratulations, well done, and thank you very much also for your time um, because I know there's been a lot of demands on you and the management and the teams uh, this week. Um, it, it's just such a great time in Tyrone, and I have to say uh, I was at all of your Ulster games this year and it was just great to watch guys improve and see the likes of Colin mm. getting back and Conor McKenna, you know, kind of, I'm sure for them, the justification in their minds of, I came back from Australia, as in in in, in yeah. Connor's case, and for Cahill could have gone and stayed, but um, I'm sure there's a vindication for them as well. But look, Fergal, thanks very much for joining us on the ExtraTime.com Friday podcast. Enjoy the rest of the celebrations, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Ashin. This is the ExtraTime.com Friday podcast. We're joined now by former Derry footballer and BBC Sport NIGAA analyst, and of course, well-known coach Conleith Gilligan. Conleith, how are you? I am as well as any dairy man can be on the week of Tyrone winning another all Ireland. I mean, I'm very well, thank you. You've had to put up with some noisy neighbours who we will talk about in just a second. We'll also go through the best performers of the year. It's not necessarily, you know, the best 15 or an all-star selection, but we'll just highlight some of the players who stood up in 2021 and there was a number of them. And firstly, the final itself, Tyrone beating Mayo. Everyone knows that at this stage, of course. But... You've watched it back a couple of times since. Has your view changed on the game from when you first watched it? Yeah, amazingly it has. I suppose watching it and in the evening after it, you think about all the good things Tyrone done and accentuated all the real positives. And then, you, hey, you know, all the highlights of Mayo's self-destruct were there and you kind of thought this was a game that Mayo never were in and maybe couldn't win. And when you watch it back again and you look at moments that, for example, Petey Hart, scored a mark 
And that was their first point of the second half. And, you know, that has been rhymed out a number of times with goals win games. And for Tyrone, that's what exactly it was. They got the goals that kept them, kept Mayo at bay for long periods. But for long periods, outside of Mayo's composure, they've done so many things right. And, like, they'll be kicking themselves because that was their opportunity. And they weren't a million miles behind Tyrone in terms of the team overall team performances. Was there anything they could have done on the day to tweak things, the Mayo management, to keep themselves in the game or possibly even win the game? Well, when we talked last week, the one thing that was really well signposted for Mayo was they had to keep goals out. You know, they played in eight finals and conceded 15 goals. And all of a sudden, it was two goals a game. And here we are, another final defeat for Mayo and they've conceded another two goals. Like, the one thing Mayo are going to have to do is try and take the element of unknown out of it because the one thing seems to be a pattern is that Mayo get to a final and they will concede two goals at some point. Now, this time they improved and they kept them out early, but it was the same result and ultimately that was the biggest difference. They have to find a way of getting a lot meaner at the back and they play a really, really good brand of football where it's gung-ho and they go man-to-man and they play a really nice brand of football, but probably for Mayo now to win an All-Ireland, they're going to have to probably change their DNA. That's difficult to do, isn't it? Or can you do that when you have a talented bunch of players like they do and a very good management as well? Yeah, I think they can. And look, there's been a lot of doom and gloom in certain quarters and a lot of really slander on some of the Mayo players, which I think has been very unfair. Like, this is a new team. You know, like, no, whenever you look at some of the players that, are, that aren't there now um, in terms of injuries, injuries, like it's a new team and they'll learn from that. The Tyrone team is very much like it was in 2018. So they're probably more experienced of losing that final. Um, and Mayo have a lot of positives, but they can change. They can, of course. Um, a lot comes around whether does Lee Keegan go another year? Um, will Aidan O'Shea go another year? So there's a lot of things like that in the winter that'll have to be looked at. But Mayo definitely have to change. They cannot go into another National League or another Championship doing the same thing and expecting a different result. They have to rip up the script and really go at it again. But they can do it. I don't think they're anywhere near as bad or in as much trouble as some people would make them out to be. Aidan O'Shea is an interesting talking point because he's got an awful lot of attention since the game. Now, a lot of it is wrong and personal abuse on social media or any other form of media, as we did see, is absolutely wrong. But as for he himself during that game, did he play okay? Should he have been moved into the forward line and should they have lumped the ball to him? Because I heard, I think it was Paddy Andrews on the uh, football pod and off the ball along with Andy Moore and saying, basically, if you play Aidan O'Shea at 14, you kind of have to long, lob the ball into him and that's not necessarily what Mayo do. How, what did you make of his performance and what do you think they could and should have done with him on the day? Yeah, well, look, I think going, the week leading into the game, and like, I, I listened to a podcast where, where Shami O'Shea was, was interviewed and he talked about Aidan, you know, where he maybe could have let that go and the fascination that everybody has with Aidan O'Shea in the media. Um, the problem is that nobody knows what to do with them and it's not Aidan's fault. He's putting in the effort and training. He's putting his hand up for selection and managers are picking him. I would go back and look, I think management have to take responsibility in terms of what they do with him. If they can find a rule for him and build something for him, great. But if they can't, then they can't play him. And I suppose when we looked at it last week, I would have played Aidan O'Shea but in hindsight, would have been better coming on with 20, 25 minutes to go. I think that might have been his role. Easy now in hindsight. But yeah, I think they have to find a role for him. Is it 14? I don't know. And the, you know, there's been a lot of simplistic talk this week about, I lump the ball in. Yeah. You know, if they do that, teams play and change. Throne would have put somebody in in front of them if they started lumping ball in. That's not the answer. The answer is having a system where you kick an odd high one in, then you kick an odd one in front. Aidan O'Shea is well able to win ball in front of him. And he did win. To be fair, yeah. I thought this was one of his best. Like, he's had worse finals. And again, when you look at it, for any player to play in seven finals, it's an incredible achievement in itself. But to lose them, it's just heartbreaking. Did, did he just not it's, have the runners coming off him when the ball went out in front to him? Because now that you mention it, I do remember him having possessions and just him looking around. And of course, then it looks bad on him, but it's not necessarily his fault if no one's making the run to get into the right position. Yeah, and the one, the one thing that the Tyrone defence will be known for is from that final. A wee bit like going back to the 05 final where they surrounded Dar O'Shea, and, um, or maybe it was 03 final where they surrounded Dar O'Shea. The same one will be McNamee and Michael O'Neill 
and Michael McKernan getting in and around him and turning the ball over and then being in his face. That's the one thing. But that ball should have been away. There should have been somebody there. But the key moments for Aidan O'Shea just went wrong. He had a shot early in the first half that he tailed to the right and wide. The long ball from a check out that he got. He was one on one with McNamee. Looked a wee bit unsure of himself. Tried to check the point that got blocked down for a 45. If either of those two things go over, he might have a different game. But it's all ifs, buts and maybes. Yeah. The problem is, he's been to another final and while a lot of people want to talk about, well, he's not that type of forward, in all the finals he has had shots, he had scores, he hasn't scored in seven. It's not good. It's not good for him. And psychologically, there's no question that he's in trouble in them games. And you look at it now, would it have been better for him not to start that final um, and maybe be used as more an impact player? Like next year, he'll be 32 and his role will probably have to change just due to the physical demands. But I think he still has so much to offer. He is their leader. And if they can find something for him, it's a management job. And if you just use that as like a very similar comparison, and maybe it's not fair, like Peter Hart has been much maligned in Tyrone over a number of years that on the big games, he's been able to be marked out of it. Duhar and Logan have found a new role for him at six, where he's actually doing the marking and he's more free. And is it a coincidence that he's probably going to get an all-star playing a different role. It's not his job to put himself in a role, but could Mayo have done something similar, put him somewhere out of the firing line? They're the questions, but all in all, you still have to perform in a final, and unfortunately for Aiden, it's another final he didn't perform in. And like that's seven, which is some achievement in itself, but um, that, that has to hurt. And to be fair to him, he was injured going into the semi-final, so maybe he was still feeling the effects of that injury in the final. Um, I, I, and... and <laughs> It's kind of ironic in wanting to take the focus off Aidan O'Shea. We've kind of, well, I've kind of put the focus on Aidan yeah, O'Shea. Yeah, and, and we all do, but, but he's that type of figure. Yeah. Well, he's that type of figure. And unfortunately, like if it's Dunny Gall, you're talking about Michael Murphy. You know, if it's Kerry, you're talking about Clifford. Um, the one advantage Throne have is that they didn't really have that one big character. Um, there wasn't that one player that you could have put your hat on and said, I think he's the man today. They just share the responsibility and ultimately, that's what stood them in good stead. Well, maybe the one player that they do have that's in that bracket is McShane, but it's confusing for Mayo because, well, they knew he was coming on, but they just didn't know when and they didn't know what kind of game it would be by then. Yeah, and that's the, that's the unknown. Like, that was a shot in the dark for um, the drone management. Do you play what arguably could be your best team at the start? Or do you keep it and finish with a stronger team than you started with? And I suppose it's doubling have showed down the years, sometimes having a sub that you know is going to make an impact. You know, a lot of times you bring on a sub and you're hoping he does something. But like Dublin knew when McManaman came on what he was going to do. Tyrone knew that whenever they brought on Cahill McShane, what he was going to bring to the party. And that's a massive weapon that you're able to deploy. And I think when you look at both sub benches in the semi-finals worked a treat. And both sets of managements would have been hoping to do something similar. Unfortunately, the Mio sub bench weren't able to produce that whereas Tyrone subs came on and done really well and probably seen them over the line. What about the job that Fergal Logan and Brian Dewar have done? I think it's fair to say after the game in Killarney, no one expected them to compete for the All-Ireland. Manny didn't even think they'd compete for Ulster. Then when they won Ulster, people were still saying, yeah, but they'll come up against Kerry and they might struggle. Then Mayo were much fancied for the final, but Fergal and Brian did the trick. Can you try and give us some insight into how they evolved this team and how they managed to get them over the line for an All-Ireland title, a first since 2008. Yeah, well, it's a very strange one in that whenever Mickey Hart wasn't going back, like there was no clamour for the job. There wasn't a number of people saying, I want to manage Tyrone. Um, Brian and Fergal, based on what they'd done with the, the 20s or 21s at that time, were the obvious choice. Um, but a joint management ticket, I'll be honest, hands up, I thought they've got this wrong. You know, you could have Fergal or Brian as manager and the other man as assistant. But the fact that the two of them are joint, who makes the decisions? But in fairness, early on, they went and they wrestled Peter Donnelly away from Monaghan. They wrestled uh, big Joey McMahon away from Fermanagh. You know, Collie Holmes came in, who was involved with the successful Dungannon, uh, Tyrone winning team, uh, championship team. So they assembled a group of people around them and just allowed them to do their job. That was the most impressive part for me, that they were able to get all the people they wanted. And from there on, maybe the doubts drifted away, but in Killarney, they went toe-to-toe, man-to-man, call it what you want. And they had a, it was a complete bloodbath. In hindsight now, it was the best thing ever happened. But at the time, 
There was a lot of soul searching done on her own. And then the doubts around the management and the doubts around the players were there. And at that stage, like I couldn't have foreseen, or probably nobody could have foreseen yeah. that this drone team would want to win all Ireland. But in terms of Fergal and Brian, they're just so quiet and unassuming. Like you never like when you, you look the cult of personality now where a lot of interviews in the lead up to the All Ireland final, you know, particularly in the in the wider in the media in the South was a lot of around James Horn and you know how he's reinvented this team again and you know there was a lot of interviews about him and the management and stuff. That didn't happen in Toronto. Like Duhur and Logan, they don't want the limelight, they want well out of that. And I think that served the team well. And I think especially around the COVID stuff, you know, they were able to keep a low profile because it hadn't been out any other time. And when Fergal Logan comes out, like he is such a genuine man. If he says there's a problem, you tend to believe him because that's the type of person he is. And I think that's the honesty and the integrity of the man in charge. You kind of can see that a wee bit in the team as well. Um, now that they've got over the line. And just to leave it on Mayo, I don't want to sound like I'm obsessing about Mayo, but there's been so much talk about uh, Tyrone in the last couple of days. And obviously earlier in the podcast, we heard from Fergal Logan. Now, the reason I'm not referencing what he said to you is because I'm recording you before that interview is recorded, if that makes sense. But can Mayo come back? And keep in mind, they'll have Killian O'Connor hopefully back next year as well. And a lot of people are saying they can't, but I'm not convinced those people have seen a previous season of Mayo before. They don't think Mayo can come back. <laughs> Yeah, look, the one thing about Mayo, and you have to give them credit, and I know after that final, a lot of people are saying, I'm just, I'm sick of Mayo now, you're just glorious. But they will come back. Um, now, the interesting bit will be is how the championship structure change, whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage, because to get back in at that stage again in the normal provincial system, they don't have a huge amount to do to be back there or thereabouts. Um, so, yes, they'll come back. They'll probably train on earth one or two more players. Some of the subs will be a wee bit older. Um, but the question marks will still remain around your Lee Keegan's, you know, your Rob Hanley's, your Aidan O'Shea's, those players. The rest of them are young enough, you know, your Kevin McLaughlin's. The rest of them are young enough. And I would imagine some of those players will step away to lose another final, to have to go at it again pre-Christmas to start all the work. And I know the club championship starts now next week in Mayo. It's going to be difficult for those players. But I think the younger players, you know, the likes of your, you know, O'Hara's and, you know, Cohen's, you know, you obviously you'll have uh, McLaughlin back um, that get injured, you know, McHale's, Conroy's. Like, they're all young. They've had a taste of this now. Yes, they've been at the wrong end of it, but they'll want more of that. You know, they've seen they can go toe-to-toe with the best. So there's no reason why they won't go again. And I think it's whether the management can change enough to do something different. You know, because doing the same thing just won't be enough now. They are going to have to change and it may be a case that they're going to have to start making their game plan a whole lot more clear to try and get over the line. Okay, let's talk about the best players of the season. We'll start with goalkeeper. Is it just too obvious and too easy to say Niall Morgan debate ended? Given the final that he had, yeah, absolutely. Uh, at semi-final stages, you know, you would still be making an argument for Began and, and for Rob Hanley just based on stuff they've done away from goalkeeper. The, the thing with goalkeeper now is like when you talk about all stars and goalkeepers, you're no longer talking about point blank saves. That's gone. It's about sweeping from the back. It's about their kickouts. It's about pushing up on to the opposition's kickouts. And and for that, um, Began's been good. Morgan has probably took it to a, another level. I thought on Saturday, his skill level is just off the scale. He is a brilliant. As we talked about in the last podcast, and I said to you, he would make most teams outfield. Division three, division two, and and, and maybe and maybe more. Um, he is an excellent footballer, but his skill levels for what he was doing, especially whenever Drum were under pressure, and the ball went back to him, he wasn't content just to fist it till a corner back. He was putting outside of the right shots, 30, 40 meters, and just going right over Mio's press, and that was the difference. And you look at the Dublin game; the ball went back to the Dublin keeper, and he wasn't able to do that. It was back and back and back, and allowed Mio onto them. I thought for me. Morgan in that position, I think it's just been a game changer. And I think the final he had was just incredible. And if McCurry had scored that goal from the long pass of his, that would have just been nice on the key. And it's such a great story as well, Niall Morgan. He's spoken about it a lot in the last couple of days about how people doubted him and you know maybe even he doubted himself, but he stuck at it and now he has his Celtic cross. Yeah, and that's the reward. Like And Morgan and, and Matty Donnelly and you know, Petey Hart... Like they had toiled at this for a long time and 
a bit like some of the, the Mayo players, maybe not just as high a profile, but they had some really bad defeats. You know, Donegal, there was a stage where they couldn't get over Donegal in, in any competition. And, you know, so for them to come forward and get this now, and it, they'll appreciate it a lot more than the likes of your, you know, McShane's and your um, Michael McKiernan's because they're they're older. They know how hard it is. A lot of them younger players in Tyrone now, some of them are in their second or third season. And the success, I think it's going to be like this every year. For Pity Hart, Morgan, like they've been at this a long time, so they'll really appreciate that Celtic cross. Defenders. So are we saying Niall Morgan, best keeper? Absolutely. I can't see them not giving it to him. I just can't see it. Okay. And again, the one thing we have to caveat this was that the All-Stars are divisive in as far as they're all opinions. And, you know, you'll get half a dozen journalists in a room, you know, sort of fighting their own corner for the, the areas they live in. So um, it is so subjective in that every team nearly needs to get a turn at it. So what we'll pick... Conley, Conley, on Conley, Steve, Conley, hold on a second. Be what comes out. Are, you, are you suggesting that there's geographical bias in the opinion of some All-Star se- selectors? Conley, that's a well, scurrilous I, accusation. I think, I think historically, <laughs> historically going down the line, I think there's been a few players have missed out um, yeah. very unfairly. Okay, well, I, I, I want to clarify, I was never a judge and nor would I really be qualified to be. But I was always <laughs> no, happy, I wouldn't want that I, job I, either. I was always happy to go on the All-Star trips, though, when they were available. Um, let's talk about the defenders. Who, who stood out for you in, in defence? Yeah, well, look, to be honest, as you'd probably expect, this is a carve up between Jerry, Tyrone and Mio, yes. with a, an odd exception. But um, the question will be, like, I think Hampshire will definitely get one. Um. I think McNamee has put himself in a great position to get one. And the question for me would be, will O'Hara get one in the corner? Um, like, for example, like Tom O'Sullivan had a, had a good year. Um, absolutely nullified McCurry. And I know he didn't have a huge amount to do probably in the, the Munster Championship, but he's in a serious shout there. And then the question will be, does that mean Lee Keegan moves out? Because obviously this is now all, it's not just the position they played. And because positions mean so little, it's just about getting him a position in the six. So for me, I think O'Hara has done himself no harm. Um, the final probably wasn't his best, but I think Hampshire will definitely get one. Um, I think it comes down then between three of O'Hara, for me, McNamee and Tom O'Sullivan. And I would probably give, I think O'Sullivan will get one based on Kerry getting a semi-final. And I think it'll then be between McNamee and O'Hara. And I think McNamee has probably done enough at this stage, probably to deserve it because he did get all the hard jobs. He did get all the big players, your David Clifford's. Um, and while he had a difficult time with David Clifford, you know, a lot of people have struggled a lot worse. Is, is the fullback the one position that remains as it always was? Or would you uh, even think it's class back to me as a traditional fullback? Just yeah, I think, I think it's the last bastion of uh, positions because you still need somebody to stand in front of the goal. Now, it changes in that some players get up, like McNamee getting up to school that point against Jerry was incredible. Yeah. And it was a massive lift. So, um, Hamshi is in that traditional role even though he's been going out and tracking players but I think within that the last position probably three and six you know eight and nine arguably are the positions that, that have remained pretty constant you know even the full forward position now is, is interchangeable and you can find that player anywhere um, so in that full back line I think McNamee has done enough I think Hamshi has probably done enough and it's maybe O'Hara or Tom, Tom O'Sullivan for me Yeah when we're naming teams now we should probably just say defenders, midfielders, attackers and even at that, it that, doesn't overly really terrify it. Like I, at the yeah. days now of me naming a team at the start of a match, as I generally do, and saying corner back, corner forward, you know, I think that's pointless. It has been for a few years, and you only do it just to clarify what number yeah. they're wearing. So I think from here on in, when we're doing games, it'll just be look, these players are wearing the following numbers, and here's where we think they might play. So is there anyone else in the defensive argument there before we move on to uh, midfield? Well, within that, that's the three. And then within that defensive bit, look, Lee Keegan's going to get one and I think they'll probably push him out somewhere to give it to him. McGeary has made himself a shoe-in. Yeah. And then the interesting bit was, like, Myler's also a shoe-in, but they could probably move Myler up into wing half forward because he has had such a... He's had such a role where he's been marking wing half forwards and wing half backs and he's been up and down the lane. And, and for me, he's the one player that, that absolutely gets in all day long. So... He, if he's not a half back, if he not, doesn't get in a half back position, he certainly will get in at half forward. Another two outside shots, shots would be whether you know Gavin White has done enough for um, probably the likes of a Paddy Durkin, um, who has had a very, very solid year. Although, when you look at the job Myler done on him in the final, 
that probably could cost them. Yeah, sometimes do guys nearly get done and punished for reaching a final, if that makes sense? Like, say, for example, with a couple of Kerry guys you mentioned there, Tom O'Sullivan, if he'd got to the final and played badly, he might have played his way out of this kind of all-star selections type team. But because he didn't, there's no further evidence to go on than the semi-final. So he kind of nearly gets rewarded for not getting to a final. Whereas Durkin might lose out because he got to a final. I think you're absolutely correct. And and that that's the unfairness of it. And I suppose this year, where you've just had the provincial system, where you look at who Tom O'Sullivan has played against, you know, really his only test was Darren McCurry and he passed with flying colours. Um, whereas you look at some of the other players that even that hasn't been mentioned, like Michael McKernan didn't get a mention in that, and he has marked some of the best players, you know, all division one teams and has acquitted himself really well and has scored two points through the championship. So um it can work for you or against you I think in this case it probably might work against Durkin yeah uh, Michael McKernan is an interesting one he won an all-star a couple of years ago and I was at the award ceremony and of course when you're in the media at these things they'll give you the list of all-stars a wee while before they're named just so you can write it up and get your report out and I was recording a report outside and a Tyrone man heard me and he said oh I better give Michael a ring and tell him he's won and I said whatever you do don't do that you'll spoil a wonderful moment for him and he mm-hmm. said, oh, I'll go and lump on him. So and I was like, well, first of all, you can't do that because I think the betting is closed and rightfully so. I said, and secondly, it's cheating. He says, well, I'm definitely going to ring him now. And I actually almost jumped to physically take the phone out of his hand to say, do not spoil the moment for this lad and his name being read out. Because at that stage, you know the way sometimes they'll name the hurling team before the awards and they'll have the yeah. football nominations and they'll do the opposite every now and then or every second year. But... <laughs> I won't quite say it came to blows because I'm not that dumb to get into a physical altercation with the Tyrone man, but like, cause he wasn't a player or anything like that. He was, uh, but I just, I just, I, I, I'm just glad that Michael McKernan's moment wasn't spoiled. Anyway, that's a, that's a side roll. Yeah, and, and, was, and look, and I think it was young player of the year that year yeah. in 2018 and, and well-deserved and, you know, and he has been able to back that up with more mature, mature performances as well. And like he didn't get a mention in that, but yeah. like he's been brilliant all year for Toronto. He has. Now, I don't think he would have been able to answer the phone because he was in the ceremony. But anyway, that was a tangent and a needless one. Let's talk about midfield. Who gets in there or who are the contenders? Yeah, well, look, um, again, Ruan has been a revelation all year. And although he didn't have his greatest day in the final, um, the sending off was unfortunate. Hmm. But I can understand the frustration at that end. But I think for me, Ruan definitely gets an all-star. Um, and then the question, which is the hardest one, is does, does Colin Kilpatrick get it? Or um, is it Kennedy? And again, I'm not sure. Both of them have been brilliant. So it's one of the two I'm going to get it. I don't think there was really many more big performances throughout, um, particularly at the latter stages. Um, when you look at, you know, Morn and Jeremy O'Connor, like they were well cleaned out by by Tyrone um, at, at stages as well, although they had probably more of an influence than, than Ruan O'Connor did have in the final on them. So I think um, if I was putting my neck in the line, I think uh, Colin Kilpatrick will probably edge it just based on uh, the catch for uh, for Darren McCurry's goal. Yeah. And I think that was just a big pivotal moment. And, you know, when, everybody, when, you're, when you're looking at the sort of pros and cons and, and both were brilliant I think that probably was just edge it for him so I'd, I'll be going with uh, Ruan and, and Kilpatrick If we're trying to market GA outside of the Irish market that's the moment you put in the highlights reel Yeah that's it That and, whole goal uh, Yeah look it just had everything everything that you want you know long checkouts that we've been crying out for and they'd worked on it and it was just amazing and it was just the run the new look pass from uh, McKenna. From McKenna, just it just had everything you would want. And I think when you look at great goals in all Ireland finals, it'll be up there with them. It certainly will. Right, let's get into the forwards, and you can do this whatever way you want. You can go half forward line, full forward line, as we've already spoken about. The traditional positions are kind of gone anyway, so just just have at it. Yeah, well, look, um, depending, Mailer will get a, get an all-star. It may be wing half back or maybe wing half forward. He'll definitely get one. The question, the big question, I suppose, is before the semi-final, Potty Clifford was looking good for player of the year, let alone getting an all-star um, based on his performances. But in that semi-final, he was so dominated that, you know, I start to wonder, I still think he will get one. 
um, because he did have a great year and he'll be in. Um, and then it comes round like Sludden for me, like Neil Sludden didn't play a lot of league football, he really struggled with it. But he is at some championship. His contribution in the final was just immense. Like his, his passing, his work rate, and the two point two points in all Ireland final for a modern working wing half is just incredible. I think he's in with a great chance. Um, up front, I think Conroy will get one. It'll be him or Donahue, but I think Conroy might just get the nod. Uh, obviously, David Clifford is definitely getting one. McCurry's definitely getting one. And then there's probably one position there that three or four different players are are vying for. Um, and I don't think it'll come from anywhere outside of that Kerry, Tyrone, Mayo accent. I, um, I don't see anybody from Dublin making that team just based on the historical issues. But when we look at all stars, all the provincial winners always tend to get at least one. So the question would be which one of the Dublin players will Kieran Kilkenny get one? I think he's an outside possibility for a for a half forward. Is and, and I want to be very clear here. He's a fantastic footballer. Is he kind of the easy go to because he's so good with possessions? If you really need to give Dublin an all star, is he just an easy fix? I think that's exactly what it is. Um, I think he's a brilliant player and he has had a poor season by his standards. And that's the thing, mm. you know, like anybody else plays as well as he does through the year and wins a provincial medal you're going, this has been brilliant. But by his standards, he just hasn't been there, particularly in the semi-final. And I think he's an outside chance. So you're looking at, I think it'll be Mailer if because there's enough defenders there that'll put a case for it. I think they'll move Mailer into the half-forward position. I think they'll give Potty Clifford centre half-forward. And I think that Kilkenny will get a wing half-forward position. And again, just to clarify, David Clifford, full forward, Darren McCurry in the corner. And I think Conroy will probably get the other corner. I'll say this, you're very solid on these selections. I was giving you the caveat of you can just name nominees, but you've actually gone... Ah, that's too, that, that's too easy. Yeah. That's too easy. Well, Give your colours to the mask. Because I got the prediction for the final wrong when I tipped me over. So <laughs> I, want to, I want to have something that I can go to and say, look, maybe I was right. You were not um, the only one, to be fair. You were not the only one, to be fair. Well, look, it'll be interesting to see how your selection compares with the actual selection. I don't know when the nominations or whatnot are out, but um, I can't imagine veering too far off what you've selected there. But again, and, and again, look, when we look at, and obviously we all know that all stars are given from like, more traditionally all in quarterfinals, semifinals and finals. Yep. But like there has to be, and I know I suppose there's an Ulster bias here, but in that wing half forward position, was there a more influential player throughout the, the, the league and championship than Ray O'Neill had an exceptional year and he's obviously definitely going to get a nomination but there's an argument that could be made for Ray O'Neill at wing half forward yeah. um, and, and there's, a, there's an argument could be made for, for Ray McInespe, um from a Monaghan point of view after the year he has had um, so like, there are a number of players that will get nominations and that will be in conversations um, but unfortunately it looks like unless you're at the sort of semi-final final stages you tend to miss out on these type of awards. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I don't mean to disrespect it, uh, Ryan and Rian, who you mentioned there, but I didn't even think of that because I've just got such a recency bias for the semifinals and the finals. And I was at those games, by the way, at all the Ulster games. So I've no yeah, excuse. And, and again, and, like, and that, that's normal because what happens is everything takes over yeah. and everybody looks, focuses on the last number of games. And when you looked at it and somebody said to me recently, you know, well, what sort of a championship was it? And I said, look, I thought it was a really good championship. But I'm thinking of Ulster final, all Ireland semi-final and final, or, or provincial yeah. finals um, that were decent. Yeah, we, we'd, have, we'd have run of three, four poor games at the start of Ulster, didn't we? Then we got... The, st- the, start, the start of all the championships, yeah. like the average winning margin at the start of the championships was 11 points, 12 points. And as the competition whittled down, it came into two and three and four points. And that's what it is. But you tend to forget there is that unconscious bias that you only really remember what was straight in front of you. And unfortunately, with all stars, it's very similar. And look, the team that wins the National League tends to get a turn, you know, but I think this year that's in it, Ray O'Neill for me would be the big shout outside of the the semi-final teams. Yeah, and then of course you forget moments like Derry and how well they played against Donegal, uh, Wexford. Yeah. yeah, I was, again, going, I was going and, to say giving Dublin they, a close run. It wasn't, but they played well against them, and they won a championship match. You know. Yeah. What, just, what What happens there is like there will be some of those players will be rewarded with a nomination. Um, but it just you know the likes of a Gareth McKinless for Derry, who was brilliant. 
all year, right through winning the league. You know, awfully had a few players that have had great years. I know the championship didn't go just as well as it wanted, but they will be in the mix. They'll get a nomination and that'll sort of probably, especially the younger players, that'll fuel them to go again and, and try and go one better the next time. Yep, and Louth bringing Offaly to extra time. All of those things are forgotten uh, when we get to this stage of the year. Um, Conley, just before I let you go, Kerry, I, I'm not sure how to phrase it. They're on the search for a new manager who might turn out to be their old manager, but um, what do you make of that situation? Yeah, it looks very, very messy. I don't know anything about the internals of it, yep. um, but the fact that Jack O'Connor want, agreed another term and then left made it look very much like he's in the frame for this Kerry job but whenever Peter Keane didn't leave the job you're going oh right there's something up here and then they've asked for nominations for a job that somebody's already in albeit I know his term's up um, I think I don't know the internals of it mm-hmm. I think it probably could have been handled better but it looks like it could be a Jack O'Connor um, Peter Keane toss up for who goes and it's sort of more of the same on both occasions. You know, Jack O'Connor has had successful spells. He's had underage teams in Kerry. So, you know, it would be a very safe appointment. Um, did Peter Keane do enough this year to improve from the, the very poor Munster semi-final that they lost? They're the questions. And ultimately, there'll be a steering committee and the senior players will probably have a voice in that. And they'll probably end up deciding if they want to stick or if they want to twist. And that's where I think it'll be. And and it's all, it's all on the players at this stage, basically, to decide that. Because it's, it's the same, if you look at any management situation, like Stephen Kenny, the Republic of Ireland manager, people are doubting him, but players haven't turned on him. And that is a big thing. That's, I won't say what, yeah. what's keeping him in the job, but it's certainly a big factor. It could be the same with Peter Keane. And look, I don't know, and you don't know. What's interesting is I thought Tomas O'Shea might get involved in some way, shape or form. But of course, he's gone to Offaly now. Yeah, and that, that, was, that was very... like. Offaly had done their business very quick. You know, whether they knew this was coming down the line, but they got him nailed because he would have been the very obvious choice. Um, whether it was in, in a coaching capacity because he's done a fair wee bit of coaching now um, uh, in the club scene. Whether he got involved. But now that he's out of it, does that mean, you know, and obviously you look towards Monaghan where, where Donny Buckley's there. Obviously he was with Peter Keane. Obviously he's not probably going into that backroom team. But if a Jack O'Connor was to get a job the same way that Fergal Logan was able to entice Peter Donnelly from Monaghan could Jack O'Connor who's worked with Donny Buckley before could he entice him in like that would be a very interesting prospect and you know some maybe one or one or two ex-players you know would Morris Fitz stay or would they want a completely new team so there's loads of different permutations uh, the one thing about Kerry is they'll probably not go external and there probably won't yeah. be any even external candidates and it's just interesting to see whether some other player was maybe going to throw his hat in the ring um, but at this stage it looks like uh, time costs between Peter Keane staying in and Jack O'Connor and I think you hit the nail on the head when you said the players will probably end up deciding in uh, quiet conversations away from the meetings and it's funny as well in Cork there's whispers well it's not whispers someone has actually said you know what maybe we should look outside let's not rule it out but it doesn't necessarily mean they will go outside anyway Connolly there are so many things we could talk about and we could keep going throughout the winter on management positions rumours and all that kind of stuff as Michal Omar Hertig used to call it, winter talk. Uh, but the club... Yeah, and I think... Go on. And I think the one thing that, the one thing the podcast world is beat for is a podcast that just solely operates on rumour. And <laughs> I, I think that would be... That, that's a podcast that people would tune into. There are laws, to be any laws, Yeah, that, we've got the corner of the market. The, well, we still have to stick to the libel laws. Look, that that's for somebody else. We will, you know, we'll let our legal team deal with that. We'll, we'll get, just say whatever we hear, whatever we hear in the pubs. We'll get Joe Brawley to work with us full time. He's a barrister, or Fergal Logan, another barrister. They'll they'll protect us from anything. We'll, that we'll, 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 just, we'll just we'll just have Joe on the show all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be um, that would be interesting if not a bit clickbaity. I have to say, I wasn't impressed with his article about Aidan O'Shea. I thought it was in poor form. Joe's a brilliant writer and a, and. Uh, a lively character and like he's whatever you might think of him he's box office you want to hear from him but i just thought nah come on man that was a bit old. that was a bit out of order but look anyway that's um that's just my opinion yeah oh no definitely definitely it uh it's straight you know a lot of the points he made in the article were absolutely brilliant and very hard to argue against and you know there a lot of them stood true but you know once you yeah. get sort of personal with players and and people it just it's not it's not good and it, it doesn't help the conversation or the argument for anybody yeah I think you've nailed it there okay Conley Gilligan thanks for joining us on the extratime.com Friday podcast and uh, the very best of luck to you and Kilku for the championship season 
Thanks so much, Shane. It is the extratime.com Friday podcast, and we're joined by former Bohemians, Finn Harps, and Bray Wanderers player, and of course, LOI TV commentator, Dave Scully. Dave, how are you? Not too bad, or Shane. Good. Glad to hear it. It is FAI Cup quarterfinal weekend. Before we talk about the Cup, let's talk a little bit about the league. Dundalk, who play in the Cup this weekend, lost to Sligo during the week. Do we now just finally accept, and do they, more importantly, maybe now finally accept, they are in a relegation battle? Oh, they definitely are in a relegation battle. Like, they have a game in hand uh, over Waterford, but the reality of it is, like, to, they've had to fall from the heights right down into a relegation battle. Like, and it's, it's sad to see because, like, they were in the Champions League, the European, and now they were in the, win the league year in, year out, and now they're fighting relegation. Like, I don't seem to know what's going on in the background there. Uh, I've heard I've been hearing stories that the American lad that owns them uh, is making subs from America like bring him down and get him off and put him on so you can't be doing that like yeah it's a strange situation and you hear so many rumours who knows what's true and what isn't but what we know is that on the pitch it's not going particularly well look you've played for clubs that have been involved in relegation battles is it kind of easier and I, I know that's a silly word to use when it comes to a relegation battle because it's a, it, you know, it is anything but easy. But is it easier when you know you're going to be in that battle and you're nearly prepared and set up for it rather than a team who kind of find themselves in there by surprise and who aren't used to relegation battles and maybe that gives them a disadvantage? Um, like, you're in a relegation battle and like every game now that's coming up is like cup final. Like, but... With what's going on with they don't seem to have the fans behind them like the I think the owner's saying that the fans are causing havoc behind the scene when it's actually him that's causing the havoc like so like when you're in these relegation battles like you need that 12th man and that's the fans to be right behind you like and cheering on every tackle every throw in anything at all so like they need to sort of get a win or two very very quickly because they are in a relegation battle and it's not looking too good for them yeah, they do have a very talented squad, though. If they can get players back from injury, they should be able to pull out of it, shouldn't they? Well, the players, the players there that played in Champions League and European games and big games, so like they should be able for the the pressure and for the games that's coming up. Like, okay, well, one of the games coming up is Finn Harps tonight in the FAI Cup. It kicks off at eight o'clock. One of your former clubs, of course, Finn Harps. This is ideal for them, isn't it? Because even though Dundalk aren't in great form, even though Finn Harps are actually in good form and were unlucky uh, during the week against another one of your old club's bows, it's kind of, it's set up for, I was going to say an ambush, but is it really an ambush if Finn Harps beat anyone at home at the moment, given the form they're in? No, Bally Buffet is a very, very tough place to go. And like, their fans are always behind that team. We always said about Finn Harps, like the fans are unbelievable down there. And it's a tough, tough place like you have them dark to play on the Astro and train on the Astro like going down the ball with Ray, which the pitch wouldn't be a macklet so like it's it's going to be whoever wins the battle down there and with Finn Harris winning like four or five games before he got beat by Bohemians they're the confident team like the dark are like probably need to get an early goal they, they, they ease the confidence and ease their minds but Finn Harris trust me it's not a, it's not an easy place to go no, it's not. In every possible sense, when you get there, it's tough. And the roads to there aren't particularly amazing either. What have you liked about Finn Harps in the last couple of weeks and months? Just, I, like, I like seeing them doing well. And I'm glad like this year like they're, they're not going to the last like one or two games to, to be fighting the relegation playoffs. Because there's some great people down there. And Ollie Horgan, what a manager and what a man. Like The, the stuff he does behind the scenes with... Uh, the players and the, the walk he does behind the scenes getting uh, like highlights of other teams. Like you'd have someone in the in the stands with a and with an iPhone watching what way they take their corners and all that sort of stuff. Like it's just the behind the scenes that people don't see. Like and he's a gentleman as well. Like and just the, the whole club is just brilliant to be involved with, I have to say now. Yeah, they seem like a pretty decent club to be uh, involved with uh, it was actually up there for the relegation playoff against Drogheda uh, not last year, the year before. And afterwards, they were, they were asking, you know, are you staying around? And we said, um, no, we're heading back to Dublin. And they were like, well, come in and eat with the team. They were having a little bit of a get-together because they'd avoided the relegation. They were like, no, come in. You know, you're welcome. It was, it was great. So it was lovely. One of uh, your old teams, Bohemians, taking on Maynooth University 
Um, look, quite frankly, if, if they don't win that, that's a disaster. You'd expect them to, to do what they need to do. Yeah, well, it's, it's going to be tough for uh, Keith and Trevor because they've a match coming up against Derry on uh, Monday as well. And would you want to get that European spot because you're playing a team that's not in the league, minute. But you have to, like, they have good players there. They've carried on Uncle Duff. Like, they have a good squad there. So, like, but you're yeah, looking at the, the players that haven't been playing and they wanted to try and get them in, in the game as well, where, where the game you're supposed to, supposed to win. But it's a quarter final. So, like, it's the magic of the cup as well. So, like, you have to be careful. You want to be trying to play 50% of players to play week in, week out. So, like, and, and you want to try and invest players to play that big game against Derry on Monday, like that you have to be winning because Slyga won the last game. So, we need to try and keep tops on them. You can't be relying on winning this cup to get in European spots. Uh, this year again, because the experience he had in that, and he want he want to get that again for next year, you know. Yeah, uh, you've been part of the Bohemians LOI TV stream. I, I mean, it's been a, 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 a there's been great moments of the season, but now they kind of need to put a run together to make sure they have a, a good end to this season and possibly a good run in the cup, uh, and also to get into Europe, they 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 they'll they'll be looking to secure that position, won't they? Yeah, it's like. They were very lucky there with George Kelly getting the red card and like like he's only spent for this match tonight. So like if he had got a three match ban, like the last person he had up front like was Bastian Hurley. He's gone out now now. So like we have the young lad promise come. So I would have liked to see him get another striker in case Georgie got injured or uh, got actually a red card. And like if he had got the three games, he would have been struggling. So like they want to be trying to nail down the players that they have this year that done so well in Europe and doing so well in the league and trying to add you know, like three or four players as well. So like, they're going to be a tough opposition to play against next year. See, what happens with Bohemia? It's like the players that do well, half of the squad gets snapped up. So like Trevor and Keith, they want to be learning from the last year or two and trying to nail these players down in one year or two year contracts and then try and add one or two to, to the team for next year. Yeah, the European money will help that, I suppose. I mean, that's, that's a point I've seen raised that Whereas before they kind of had to let them go because they couldn't afford to keep them. Now maybe they have a few more quid to spend on players or to keep their players. Yeah, well, they're not making money um, in the European, and he made money from the transfer from what's the, the lad going <laughs> Matt Doherty, from? Yeah, Matt Doherty, Sorry, they made a few quid from him, and like it's steady now. Like the the stadium is going to be getting built as well over the next few years. And he did that good partnership with ECU of the 10 year contract. So like, it's all looking good. And the academy is going well. The youths are going well. The girls teams are going well. So it's a good structure there. Good day. Like, you have Daniel Lambert behind the whole lot. So like, if he's good people around him. So yeah. they'll have to learn from the mistakes of the last like, 10 years. Like, paying out big money, going full time. So, like they have to learn from that, so like it's a it's a steady structure there now. So like Bohemians in the next four or five years are going to be a team to be reckoned with, you know. Absolutely, and there's a lot to admire about what the club are doing at the moment. Um, St. Pat's against Wexford Hughes again. It is the cup, so you can never say it with any certainty, but you'd expect St. Patrick's Athletic to get the win here. Definitely, I I, I couldn't like if Chris Forrest are doing very well there, scoring goals. Like Pat's are doing well in the league, so. Like Wexford, you'd say you'd be expecting Pats to win that comfortably, like you know. But it's a cup as well, so anything could happen. Like, yeah, it absolutely could. Uh, UCD Waterford, UCD at home, they'll kind of secretly fancy their chances here, won't they? Yeah, you never know what you're going to get with UCD. Like UCD could win <laughs> two or three nil, and then a week later you get beaten two or three nil. Like so, you just never know what team's going to show up. But when they like they play. Where when he fair like uh, the, the students coming in and the fit lads like so he could have a good day and you never know what happened there with the cup and they've got Colin Whelan as well who is tearing it up in the league and actually doing really well with the Irish under twenty ones they've got a striker who can score against anyone yeah Colin Whelan he can score with his head he can score with both feet he runs in behind the defence like he's a very very good player so like if, if he's on form on the day like he could go through you see so if you looking to him to get the goals. And when you're uh, planning for a game like this, how much work do you put into that one player, that one guy who can really damage you? I appreciate that any player can score and all that, but, but he's the guy they really need to watch. But, so how much work do they put into that? And what kind of planning do they do for that as an opposition? Yeah, you, yeah I'll just mention like George Kelly, like, he's top scorer, top goal scorer in the league. Like, like, 
when when Bohemians are playing different teams, like I'm just saying, George Kelly as an example, like like they know he can hold the ball up well and he brings players into play. So like you'd want to be getting like a midfielder in front of him and like you want to be trying to stop the ball going through him because he makes things happen. So it'd be same with like the lad off UCD, like so. But it, like they have other good players as well that can they can cause other teams problems as well. So you don't want to be concentrating on one player. I don't think any manager does that. Like obviously. They 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 make it aware that he's a threat, but yeah. they wouldn't be just focused on one player because you can't you can't just focus on one player. And um, when you were approaching cup matches as a player, was it a different feeling going into a cup match than it was a league? And if so, what what was that feeling? Yeah, you just take your mind off the league, like for that week and run up to like train and coming on the Monday on the Wednesday. And then it's the cup match, like it's just a different different perspective, like because the pressure's off the league, depending on where you are in the league. Um the cup match, like as I said, it's eleven v eleven, anything can happen in the magic of the cup, the FA Cup. So like you'd want to be as a player, you want to be going on a good run and trying to get into the, the Aviva Stadium in the final, you know. And can it knock your confidence if you're knocked out of the cup? We'll say, for example, if St. Pat's or if um Bowes are beaten by their opposition, Wexford and, and Minutes respectively. Um like how damaging is it when you're knocked out of the cup or if you're beaten in the cup by a team you should be beating in theory? Yeah, it'd be damaging because, like, depending on where you are in the league, like, they're fighting yeah. relegation and you, you get a win at the cup. It gives the team a bit of a boost, it gives the fans a bit of a boost because, like, it's a quarter final of the cup. So if you win that, you're going to the semi final. So you want to be playing well to get into the semi final and then into the final. So, like, and it obviously it gives the team confidence, like, depending on like, the final relegation, it gives them a little, little boost. And obviously, if they're going for the league as well, it gives them that little boost of just the next 10% of energy, you know? Well, it's going to be an exciting night in the extra.ie FAI Cup, the quarterfinals, all taking place on the one night, which maybe is a trick missed. Maybe they could have been spread across the uh, weekend, but look, they are where they are. Are you on duty for Bohemians tonight on LOI TV? I was supposed to be, but I have a match with my uh, club, Montpellier FC, so uh, I'll be there Monday night for the dirty game. Okay, well, look, my good friend much. Andy McNulty be stepping in. Okay, no better man. Uh, listen, Dave, thanks for joining us on the extratime.com uh, Friday podcast. That's Dave Scully, formerly of Bohemians, Finn Harps and Bray Wanderers. Not on duty tonight, but back on duty on Monday for the game against uh, Derry, which, which, which actually really is a big game as well, isn't it? Definitely. And like, as I was saying to you, like, if it's going to be hard for Keaton Trevor to see which team, the, the, which players do best and which players do play. So like, they, they expect them to win against Maynooth, but you have to make sure you get that win to get into the semi-final and obviously they want to be dirty they try and catch Lego for that uh, towards spot they can't be relying on to win in the cup so they want them good experience in the FA, uh, in the Aviator stage for them European uh, games next year Okay, listen Dave Scully thanks for joining us on the extratime.com Friday podcast Oh Shane thanks it was a pleasure nice speaking to you well, that's it from the extratime.com Friday podcast. I hope you have a good weekend. I'm looking forward to mine. Uh, on Monday, we look back on Ireland's clash with Italy in the World Cup qualifiers in rugby. Hopefully, we'll be talking about a victory. We have more on the Premier League and the domestic action, of course, for FAI Cup quarterfinals taking place tonight, Friday. And on Monday night, um, Derry will be taking on Bowes in Daly Mount Park. I'm hoping to get along to that. It has been so long since I've got to Daly Mount Park uh, before the lockdown, as in the original lockdown, was the last time I got there. I can't wait to get back. I love that place, even though structurally and all that had seen better days. Also, we'll have a lot of Club GA action. I'm in Cork tonight. You can watch it, actually, on the Irish Examiner GAA stream. It's Canturk against Blarney in the Senior A Hurling Championship. On Sunday, I'm in Dublin for the Senior Hurling Doubleheader of Kilmacock Croaks against St. Bridget's. And Lucan taking on St. Jude's. Those should be two good games, which you can watch live on Dubs TV, live and free, I should say. And the Irish Examiner stream, by the way, also free. And on Saturday afternoon, it's Irish League action. Um, Dungannon Swifts taking on Cliftonville. Dungannon, who have had a horrible start to the season. They've lost both of their league games, although they won in the League Cup the other night. They'll be taking on Cliftonville, who have got 10 points from a possible 12. And there's some familiar names involved in both teams. Dean Shields is actually managing Dungannon, the former Rangers, Hibs and Dundalk player, former Northern Ireland international as well. Of course, son of 
Kenny, who's in charge of Northern Ireland in a Women's World Cup qualifier. And I say Women's World Cup qualifier just to, you know, just to make it absolutely clear it's the women's team. So you don't confuse him with Dean Barraclough. Um, he's in charge of them in the World Cup qualifier, I think. Is it tonight, Friday? Anyway, sometime over the weekend. You can check that out on the BBC Sport NI uh, website or iPlayer. We'll have all that on Monday and more. I hope you have a good weekend.